Good afternoon and welcome to these uh, exciting times at the Arts and Culture <laughs> Commission, October 16th meeting. Can we have a roll call, please? <laughs> Commissioner Zerhovanesian? Uh, here. Sahakian? Here. Vidor? Here. Chairperson Oshagan? Here. For the record, Commissioner Sharikian is not present. The agenda for the October 19th meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside City Hall on October 16th, 2017. Item 2, consent items. At 2A, approval of special meeting minutes from September 28th, 2017. I'll move approval. We have a second? Second. Yes. Commissioner Zerhovanesian. Abstain. Sahakian. Yes. Vidor. Yes. Chairperson Oshigan. Yes. Item 3, introductions of presentations. At 3A, library arts and culture events presented by Chuck Weick, Community Relations Manager. Good afternoon, Chair Oshigan, Commissioners, City staff, and visitors. I have a number of events to quickly go through today. First of all, at the uh, downtown Central Library at our Reflect Space, uh, we are continuing with Wake, the Afterlife of Slavery. That continues through November 5. Uh, it's a, uh, a fascinating look at slavery and the after effects. Um, we have a number of author events. The one on top, Steve Rifle is a former uh, LA Times reporter. He has a new book. Uh, called Ishiro Honda, A Life in Film, From Godzilla to Kur Kurosawa. It's the first major biography of Japan's master of classic science fiction cinema. And that, that event on Thursday, November 2nd, will include a screening of Honda's 1962 film, King Kong vs. Godzilla. Uh, also at the Downtown Central Library, uh, Mindy Johnson, an educator, will present uh, her book, uh, Ink and Paint, The Women of Walt Disney's Imagination. Uh, this is a story, a uh, true story, about the pioneering women uh, who brought hand-rendered drawings to life on celluloid, uh, particularly for the Disney studios. Um, and that's on November 29th, 7 p.m., both events there at the Downtown Central Library. Um, this coming Saturday, in a couple days, we've got a tour of the historic Brand Library and Arts Center with Jomi Wilson. Uh, that's Saturday, October 21 at 9.30. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. You get to walk around the, the building just before it opens, and, and Jomi will tell you all about the history of, of our Brand Library. Um, the Brand 45 Works on Paper is finishing up. Uh, there's a closing reception specifically for members of the Brand Associates. So you can, uh, you can join the Brand Associates uh, that evening. That's November 3rd, 6 p.m. Uh, take a, a fun tour and, and uh, hear our uh, curator and uh, gallery director, Shannon Curry-Holmes, talk about uh, this uh, really successful um, annual exhibition. There's Shannon on the left. Just a few pictures from the opening reception. Really, those are really nice pictures too. Oh, who's that? Okay, <laughs> and this guy. Uh, really, really fun. It looked like a lot of fun. The the artwork's been up there for a couple months now. So, uh, if you're interested in that, you'll need to join the friend, the uh, associates. But you can join the brand associates that night. There you go. That's the kind of fun you're going to have. Uh, again, that's the closing reception, special reception uh, for Brand Associates members on Friday, November 3rd at 6 p.m. And that's pretty much it for my short library report. You can contact us at a couple of different phone numbers on the web and keep up with us on social media also. Thank you, Chuck. Any questions? Clarification? Okay. No question, just a small comment. They do a lot of wonderful stuff. There are so many programs and uh, events that one cannot even count on. I'm so proud to know that our city is offering and our brand associates in our brand. 
they are providing all these wonderful programs from different dances, intercultural stuff, interacting, and you know, all, all kind of innovative ideas are there. So really would encourage community to join. It's a pleasure. Next item. Item four, oral communications. There's none. Item five, business agenda at 5A, discussion item. 5A1, Public Art Master Plan Progress Report. Uh, Chair Oshikon, Commissioners, City Staff, uh, Visitors. In November of 2015, the City Council approved the 1517 Work Plan of the Arts and Culture Commission and appropriated $380,000 to accomplish activities detailed in the Work Plan, including uh, a Public Art Master Plan. Uh, I'm going to call up Barbara Goldstein, uh, who will present the following. Uh, including an overview of the public art practices in the United States, emerging themes from master plan process to date, an overview of public art procedures and next steps. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming last night. That was really fun. I think we yes. got a lot done, and, and thank you for your um, engagement with all the different little uh, pop-up workshops that we had. Um, I'd like to ask um, Regina or Tamara or both of them to come up and talk about the outreach that we've done so far because that was a question that you asked us at the last meeting. So who's got the report? Or no, you're going to hand it out, right? Yeah, it's handed out. Oh, it's already handed out. Do you want to talk about it? Yep. Hi, guys. Hello, Commissioners. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to come and speak to you again today, and thank you for all being there last night as well. We've been really busy, and you can probably tell. Um, we have uh, this really nice addition to your packet, um, and we have uh, an account of all of the outreach efforts we have, including um, how many hits we've gotten from the website. Uh, it's under 120 registered users. All the posters that we've designed and distributed to Glendale Schools. Uh, 2,500 buck slips that went out to libraries and city offices and local businesses. Uh, 10,000 of the flyers that Regina hand delivered to every Glendale school, which is fabulous. <laughs> um, the Facebook event page that was created had over 11,000 views, and you can see we had a great attendance last night based upon that Facebook uh, event page. The utility inserts will be coming. But that uh, really is inclusive of the whole city at 82,000. Uh, we've been to a lot of Glendale events, small or big, uh, presenting in person or we're tabling. And then we've also uh, given information to all the city departments. Um, in addition to compiling a very vast list of the nonprofits, including a lot of churches and temples and affiliations where we simply sent them information via email so they know. And hopefully all of you have seen the really great video that was produced by Glendale City TV um, that features Barbara, that we scripted and shot and provided all the visuals. And we're really proud of the work that we did with the city. And uh, we went from, I don't know, 80 views in one day to 200 views in the next after circulating it. And it did focus on the October 18th event, but we hope you can still circulate that because that's a way of really educating the public about what public art is and what's going on in the city with the plan. Would you like to add anything? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, on the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. there's a few more things mm -hmm. that we're still working on. It's two vinyl banners that will be installed on the GCC bridge. One will be in Armenian, one will be in English. Um, and then we're going to do 50 core class signs. They're temporary. That is pending a permit with Public Works. Um, and they're interactive, so people can um, look at the sign, answer it, so it'll have an interactive question on there, and people can answer directly by texting in. And what's cool about it is that uh, it'll link directly to the website, so it'll map the exact location of where they submitted the, um, their answer. Um, and then lastly, we're just going to continue um, visiting different events and tabling and doing announcements mm -hmm. as part of our outreach. For example, next week we're going to the annual meeting for the Northwest Homeowners Association. Uh, they actually moved their annual meeting from the October 18th, which was a conflict with our event last night, to next week, which was, I thought, very 
considerate of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just invited to come up to Montrose to speak to the Shoppers Association. That will be early in the morning on, in November. So we continue to do the outreach and we continue to spread the word about that really great website that's getting all kinds of views. Um, and I encourage you to look at not just the most popular views on there, but uh, or comments rather, but what was posted most recently. Um, I saw recently the president of Glendale Community College posted um, an idea and uh, all members of the city have been uh, engaged in conversation uh, and the back and forth that we get notifications on where there will be spirals of comments. But we're going to be collecting that data and you'll be seeing that in the eventual report that comes. Okay. Do you have any questions about our outreach? Excellent. I mean, I want to say that 10,000 flyers made a big difference because we had a bunch of students and teach not students, but teachers from GUSD mm -hmm. at, the, at the event last night. So kudos to that. I would also really uh, kudos on the interactive, the, the website and, and the, the digital platforms and the information that flows from one to the other. What exactly is going to be the choroplast signs? Are they going to be like in the middle of the street or what are they going to look like? Yeah, sorry for not explaining that thoroughly. Um, they'll be installed on utility posts throughout the city. Um, utility posts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're temporary. So they will be similar to the Glendale Walks campaign. I don't know if you've seen these small temporary choroplast signs that have been installed on utility posts with zip ties. Uh, it'll be similar to that. Um, we're, we're focusing on key locations, uh, recommendations from the... Um, the website, as well as um, from our advisory committee, as well as the city, as well as Barbara's meetings that she's been having with uh, city staff um, and keep people. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, did you approach GTV6? Is there any kind of presentation on GTV6 so it would be rerun and community right. who are watching, they would be aware of all that is being done, or the websites that they can contact. So that's another means that a lot of people who are interested with what goes on in the city, they check GTV6. Yeah, it, uh, we did place a, an ad. So you, um, whenever there's no program that's being uh, shown, there is ads that run through. So there is an ad that we placed. Um, in addition to her more detailed interview, we... Um, they also did the on the move feature that included part of Barbara's interview. Okay. Uh, we are also working with Tom very closely, Tom Lorenz, who's communications, um, and to continue to send out press releases um, and also invite the, uh, the larger press into our conversation. That sounds great. The other venue could be, um, you know, I know that uh, there's a large Armenian population in Glendale. If you would be uh, contacting the Armenian TV stations, they would love to, because there are lots of artists in the community. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they would be very eager. If you have done it already, good job. If not, mm -hmm. that's another idea to uh, kind of use their venue for your presentations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely part of our plan. Um, what, now that we're completed with this first outreach meeting. Um, from now until early December, we're going to do a big media push, especially the Armenian media, the newspapers. I know there's a lot, um, the, uh, the, the stations as well, and the radio stations, yeah, TV stations. That would be great because language could be a barrier. They can help you out with that. So you could reach out to all the members of the community. That would be a great idea. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you. I think the turnout yesterday was, was great. Um, I mean, to have enough people to have that many separate groups talking about different topics and have enough people to have a really engaging discussion. And uh, we had in a similar format panel uh, about a couple years ago. And, in, you know, it just shows that there's a lot of people out there hungry for public art. So it's great to bring them together. And hopefully it's something that will be a start of future events as well that we continue on, you know, past the completion of the plan. But thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just... Not to be repetitious, but I just have to say how obviously m how much planning, energy, and detail went into the preparation. I mean, you know, we all know what that's like, and I, I, I don't know if everybody has an appreciation of what you had to do to pull that off, but it, what, it really exceeded expectations. And one of the things that I really loved about it was sometimes in Glendale when I go to events, it's like, you know, you kind of see the same people or it's, you know, like the usual suspects, <laughs> you know what I mean? And there was such a di diverse, unusually diverse group age-wise, ethnically, every which way, and the energy and the vibe 
uh, throughout the event was really exciting to see. Um, and it was a little bit out of character for Glen Glendale, and so maybe now this is sort of the new character of Glendale, where, you know, we all work together for a common purpose. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to see everybody gather yeah. around the topic of art. Um, it really brought the city together in a wonderful way, um, and we are want to say a shout out to Thul's Coffee for donating mm. um, and the wonderful mini kebab um, that provided the, the food uh, that we catered. Um, but we also strategically reached out to a lot of different professions, whether they were the ambassadors in real estate or uh, artists themselves or uh, people who actually knew nothing about the plan. I, I talked to several people who had absolutely no idea why they were there, except I said just be there. Mm -hmm. or, um, and, and other people who, of course, had never had the opportunity to meet the commissioners, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate you being there last night and the face-to-face -face and to the wonderful nonprofit art organizations that also had that opportunity because we do have the advocacy here. You could feel the energy, and people just didn't want to leave, and they want to continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. We'll be picking it up, and uh, we just appreciate all your support. Thank you. Thank you. One last thing. When you're reaching out, reaching out to the Armenian TV stations, get contact, them. Me. contact me, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've had a couple of one-on-one -on -one meetings as well this week um, that I wanted to share with you. I met with the with Dan Bell, who's in charge of the sister cities, to talk about potential for creating some kind of cultural exchange. Um, I met with Seta Simonian from the um, Armenian Educational and Cultural Association. And I met with Brent Gardner from the, the Downtown Glendale Association. And um, also Brent told me that Jennifer McLean is going to be at their board meeting tomorrow. And so I contacted her and asked her if she would report to their board meeting on the, the walking workshop that she led last night. So um, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about how um, arts commissions work in other places because I think it would be helpful to you to do that and um, have we, we handed out the material that I gave you? Um, can I have a copy of it too? <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that I think is something that we could be talking about as we move forward is the structure of the Arts and Culture Commission. When you look at the ordinance that created the Arts and Culture Commission, one thing really kind of jumps out. Oh, I don't have it here. This is just the urban art program. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. No, nope, this isn't it either. It's the third one that's the ordinance. <laughs> no, I get every time. It's OK. Okay. Yeah. The thing that really um, this, jumps out, one? and this purple um, one? Michael at? very nicely yeah, actually it. highlighted it for me, is the powers and duties of the Arts and Culture Commission are extremely vague. You actually are almost entirely advisory, and you're now in the position where the urban art program is a program that you're responsible for. However, there's no clear structure for how you make your decisions, recommend them, and they get adopted by city council. It's very, it says advise. And I think the word advise can become a challenge because it doesn't really have very much um, clout to it. Typically what happens in, an, in other cities is that City councils empower their commissions to make certain kinds of decisions. And although all cities have a threshold for approval of contracts, they rely on their commissions to make recommendations. That allows them to have an arm's length relationship with the commission. So if there's a decision that's made that is maybe something that's not to their taste or they don't understand, they can have that distance where they can say the Arts Commission or the Parks Commission made this recommendation based on their procedures. We don't have that here. And it can be challenging because you don't really have a clear relationship around fiscal recommendations. You're not responsible for 
fiscal decisions. There, you are going to be recommending them. However, you, there has to be some more greater degree of, of responsibility given to the Arts and Culture Commission if you're going to be able to move forward with this very significant program. It's something I'll work with Michael on. Um, I know that other commissions in other parts of the country work differently, and I'm sure other commissions within the city of Glendale work differently. I believe that the way that the commission was structured might have been getting around um, maybe perhaps weak commissioners or something of that kind. But at this point, you've got a really strong commission. You're going to have a strong plan. And in order to implement the plan, you have to have a framework that allows you to go forward and make strong recommendations. Um, the other thing that happens with a lot of other commissions has to do with committee structure. I know last time you met, you assembled all of your committees. And when I looked at them, what I realized was you've got five separate committees, but four of them are basically responsible for the same kind of thing, which is physical artwork. And what I would like you to contemplate is a lot of, of arts and culture commissions basically divide their programs and their committees into two sections. One is a section that deals with programming, which is when you do grants or events. And the other is a committee that deals with physical artworks, whether they're temporary or permanent. Rather than dispersing all of your energy in all these different directions and having committees of two, which is really not a committee because you don't have an odd number of people, um, I think it would be useful for you to consider the potential of creating a, a committee that deals with public art that may have commissioners on it and also may have other members that are either conservators or academics or artists or maybe perhaps a member of the Design Review Commission so that as you begin to move towards public art being more of a welcome thing for private developers, you have people from the, you have some relationship with the Design Review Commission. So does anybody have any questions about this, that part of what I'm talking about? Um, actually, so just to clarify, so the, the earlier point, so you're talking about the powers and duties generally. Yes. That's what you're talking about. That, that's where it states very vaguely and broadly. It's very broad. It's very vague. Just to, re, it's just, just to report. And so the process would be to come up with a, a different kind of stronger language, stronger language yeah. of the duties and responsibilities. Right. And I'll bring you language that re, that relates that, that is more typical for the powers of an arts or arts and culture commission. And before I bring them forward to you, I'll be reviewing them with the city attorney. So I do think you need to tighten it up, though, because it's very open ended and. Um, there's actually no mention in this whatsoever of the um, percent for art program that's on site. And that would typically be a duty of an arts and culture commission. The way that, and you have a copy of the guidelines, um, the way the guidelines were written, it's actually not completely clear who's responsible for approving the work that developers do. It basically says, um, let me see if I can find the right section here. Um, it 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 basic it says that um, I've got the wrong page. It basically says that the council will decide who's going to make the decision, and when one point they'll 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 um, direct it to. Page seven. Is that what you're looking at? Page yeah, seven, I think three. it's on page. What is it? 8D. Okay, thank you, Michael. It's ambiguous, let me put it that way. And um, there needs to be involvement of the arts. What page, commission. Michael? Page 8, Section D. It says eight, arts eight. and it's oh, eight. Eight. It says artworks and art plans proposed and funded by the Urban Art Fund shall be managed by city council or its designee, but it doesn't say who the designee is. <laughs> proposed art plans must, quali must qualify as artwork as designed in this policy. Um, and then it begins to talk about how those art plans are done. Um, 
there are a couple of funny things in here that should be cleaned up, and one of them is who the designee is. Um, and I think that if you were to form a public art committee that included people from the design review board and some outside experts, you'd be able to make a case to city council that this would be a, a, a stronger way of reviewing things um, that are done through private development. Um, I think that that's something that we really need to take a look at. There's another piece here that is kind of unusual, and that is it has to do with art consultants. Generally speaking, on private percent for art programs, what you expect of the developer is the developer is going to use a professional art consultant to help them to select the art. Instead of saying that, these guidelines say, don't, don't say how the art is going to be selected, but they say a professional consultant will be involved to appraise whether the, the art is actually valued at the dollar amount it's supposed to be valued. If you have an art consultant working with a developer, that would come to you naturally in the form of a budget. And then at the end of the day, your staff person, and we're going to come back to the staff person in a minute, would be the person that would be responsible for saying, yes, this is what was spent, it meets the criteria, and all of those kinds of things. So those are some of the things that I think need to be resolved because they're still a little bit unusual. Barbara, in, in your experience, do you find that in these private percent for art that they, they treat it kind of like the, the designs for a building where they come for final approval after it's already fully designed? Or do you find that it's a more collaborative? It should be collaborative and it should be, uh, that's a really good question. It should be collaborative and where you want to have this happen is you want the artist to be brought in really early, around the same time as the architect, so that they can look at what the opportunities are to work together, whether it's something that's integrated into the building or it's something that's a freestanding feature. It shouldn't be an afterthought, um, because if it's an afterthought, it's just not going to, it's not going to work as well. Um, and my understanding from, oh, the other person I interviewed this week was Hassan Hagani, who wrote these, together with Arnett, Annette Vartanian and Alan Loomis. Um, was that up until now what's happened is that the work, when a developer goes into the planning department, the planning department tells them that this is an opportunity for them to integrate art and that apparently there have been some projects that have come through planning. I don't know what they are and they're not, we don't have a record of them and some of them may have stopped and started and so there hasn't really been a lot of um, connection between the planning department and arts and culture, possibly because of the um, fact that there have been staff in place and then not in place and then staff in place and then not in place. But there's also been a lot of shifting in the planning department. So I need to go back in and find out what, if anything, is in the, in the works and then start a conversation with the planning department about how to integrate the, how to communicate with, with arts and culture because these things are happening in two separate spheres which is not a good thing because it's part of your collection even though these projects are on private developments they're really part of the city's collection of art. Could so, I say something yes. in that regard? Um, being longer on the commission uh, we have had situations and there has always been the discussion that uh, when they came, I don't remember, it is in two or three different situations they came in and they explained about their projects. And uh, the issue that commissioners had was that, well, that's great, we need to have a say on that, but we need to have the design review board also in it because right. we, none of us is in um, architectural or construction and etc but it should be a joint decision exactly. but we have not it has there has been lots of you know changes and etc but that has been on the table for quite a while right. that it should be a joint decision and we should be aware of anything that comes on if, if a city has the arts and culture commission so they should be involved and also the design review board should be part of right. it so and hopefully after you prepare everything we would have a nice combination because the effort is there and the will is there for on behalf of the city I as so well. It, just, it needs to be worked out. Yeah, and there are significant projects that are coming along right. and I think that developing a committee structure that included people from the design review board as well as arts commissioners that then you would be working together and that's, uh, that's a bit more typical. 
So um, that's really um, pretty much what I wanted to talk about with regard to the structure of other commissions. But I do want to get into procedures and guidelines in a bit. Um, I want to go through the emerging themes with you. We did this in our advisory committee meeting. Barbara, if I could yes, ask yes. One more, one sure, more please. About, um, so the structure of the commission, the way the committees are structured, mm -hmm. is that a legal thing, or is this something no. that we decided and we can just change if we want to change no, it, based on your It's not memorialized anywhere. I think that it was just a, something that the commission developed in an ad hoc way. There's no memorial. There's no. There isn't. There's really no language about how no, the, the what the how the structure of the commission. You don't have a set of procedures um, that out, outline how the commission works, which is more t typically a, a commission would have a full set of procedures, which is something I'll develop for you, that would outline how the commission works under certain circumstances, and it would outline things like com committee structure. Yes, yeah. Arlene. Yeah. Um, well, there is. You know, we've, we've got the Glendale Municipal Code right. here, which, you know, it does seem like it, it's been a while since the ordinance has been updated. Absolutely, yeah. And um, there will be other ordinances that I think that could you, well, like what, what you were just talking about, will need to be updated to incorporate how the Urban Art Fund is managed, including, right. well, not only for for the private developers, but for public works. Absolutely, And yeah. planning and is... Um, uh, Arlette mentioned also the Design Review Board and the Historic Preservation Commission. Exactly, yes. Because there are also a number of buildings Absolutely. that There's you no know, will be impacted yeah. by the arts, and we want right. to get that in the mix, too. Yeah, I, I'm glad you pointed that out. The one thing, and I, I don't know whether Michael will agree with me, but I think he probably will. An ordinance is supposed to be at a very high level. The administrative guidelines and procedures don't belong in the ordinance because it's really hard to change an ordinance. So the ordinance will say in it, when it gets revised, that the Arts and Culture Commission shall create procedures that are appropriate for the administration of X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. Because that gives you the flexibility if everything changes to develop a different committee structure, just like you have now. So... Um, I'd, li is, I'd like to go through the emerging themes, sure. Um, yeah. Another thing on the committees. Um, I don't know how clear that was, but, you know, with the projects and committees that we have, we have two commissioners participating and city staff who are trained more or less in that area, which is in the area of art and music and et cetera, and also consultants that, let's say, with pop-up art or a house or et cetera. So our commissioners and city staff were also involved with the uh, consultants who are experts in the field as well. I do like the idea that we could have community as well or chosen people, but I don't know how that could be procedurized. But uh, there, there's a larger involvement rather than just the two commissioners. The two commissioners okay. are representing commission in the meeting. Okay. So uh, that's something that wasn't clear to me. So are you saying that when you've done the utility boxes, for example, it's been two commissioners plus somebody from the transportation department and an arts expert or something like that? Not, not in all of them, but most of them city staff were part of it, and also they contacted different departments in the city who might have been interested or they... they they should have been involved. But on some of the others, we have other consultants from the community, artists and et cetera, who helped our uh, committee members to make decisions on what needs to be done. So okay. it so is, it's a hit and run. It's it sounds not like always it's very the same structure. Yeah. It hasn't been memorialized any place. No. Okay. But, but just it would to be great on, to do. Yeah. But yeah. just to add on to that, too, I mean, the Beyond the Box Utility Box mural program, for example, we get together to select the artists but we don't get together for other committee meetings about, you know, strategically where are we going with this program and some of the more kind of important things, long-term uh, planning and that sort of thing. So yeah. I think it would be good to have a committee where we do have different voices, not just the commissioners right. there. And I think that, you know, as you build your program out and you're going to have various artist selections, you're actually going to want to have artist selection panels that are independent of the commission, but the commission sits on them. Because let's say that you're doing, um, let's say you're doing a, artist lighting project. You're going to want to have people on your panel that understand light sculpture or people on your panel that have worked in that area before. It shouldn't be the commissioners that are doing all of the selection. You really want to have a bigger group of experts working with you. 
Or if I can give you yeah. one last thing, too. Yeah, please. I don't think it's the last thing. Actually, I heard another, <laughs> no, <laughs> another commission say that. But, you know, uh, it, it is being done, but it could be more structured yes, and that's kind the of idea, more yeah. finalized. But uh, we do, for having all of that done, I try to imagine and help me out with that, that if we try to have any of those projects or events, uh, well, we have the commissioners, we have the city, we need to have city staff to contact to Absolutely. find the right people. So it is major for Arts and Culture Commission to have a strong uh, staff member who is allocated because we, they do a lot of work, but they have so many hats that they have to pull and right. do stuff. So we need to have money allocated so there would be a steady a person who's there who could contact because that's major work to, for every project and event to have all the right people in the community be involved because there right. should be no problem about who was not invited and what. So all of that uh, depends on that as well. So right. please, well, you'll see that that's in our that. emerging <laughs> themes. Yeah. And I was going to ask, uh, if, have you come across cities that have joint commission meetings? Because, you know, for yes. example, the development impact fees also went to the Parks Commission and they dedicated a number of projects and selected. And But we've never had a conversation about how our committee commissions can collaborate and possibly do joint Right. Well, the, the, I've, in the two of the cities that I've worked, the way, the way, this is the way that I've seen it happen. When I worked in Seattle, we had an arts commissioner that sat on the design commission to, so if an art project came through the, the design commission, they would be able to comment on it, and we had a design commissioner sit on the, on the public art committee. In San Jose, we had, um, our public art committee had commissioners on it, and it also had arts experts on it, and it also had a representative from the redevelopment agency sitting on it. And we always had an architect on that committee. Um, and whenever you had a project that was connected to a city department, you would always have the city department representative there to speak right at the beginning to talk about how the work connected with what they were doing. So a lot of the things that we're talking about now are in these emerging themes. So why don't I go through those, and then we can continue the conversation. Just one little thing. Sure. We have done that sporadically as well. But let's say when Parks and Rec, I always say that with the old name, not the present one, whenever they have had projects for the parks that involved art, Previously, they would invite uh, commissioners from the art and culture to sit on that meeting. And on those meetings, there were community members, and there, there yeah. were park people, and they were from art and culture. Right. But it, again, it's, it is uh, sporadic, kind of. It is not a structured way that everybody else right. knows that we need to be involved whenever we need to be involved. So right. that anyway, great. if it's art that's happening in the park, it's actually the Arts and Culture Commission that should we be involved. We have in the done lead. that before. Yes. You know, I mean, I know for a fact that the, the Parks Department is right now building a park that's got, it's, got, it's supposed to have three artworks in it. It has three pedestals that are, that are going in. You guys haven't even heard about it yet. So, you know, what's up with that? Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I, they're very well intentioned. They want to have art. They're expecting to come to you with three pedestals and have you figure out what to do with them. So, we do have I mean, musical events, too, and we were not aware. Right. So, I mean, we're trying to give you some chops here. <laughs> yes, that so, sounds good. Um, want a these are the emerging themes. So this is the first one. It's to, first of all, define what the purpose of the Urban Art Fund is as supporting art in free and publicly accessible spaces. This is so you can make a distinction between somebody that comes to you and says, I think you should fund a class that's going to be available to just this one elementary school and an event that's going to support the entire city. We have to develop a framework that really is about art that is for anybody that is in a public setting. There's no question in my mind that there's a need for things like grants for individual artists and, and, and arts education and all of those things. That's really not what the Urban Art Fund was intended for. The Urban Art Fund comes from developers' money to enhance the city as a whole. And so defining the Urban Art Fund and what it does fund and what it doesn't fund is super important because otherwise you're just going to have a continuous situation where people are saying, well, I think you should spend it on this or I think you should spend it on that. So we need to really develop a framework for that that says what's public, what's freely accessible. 
That doesn't mean it has to always be physical artwork. Um, the second theme is to commission impactful artworks in prominent locations, including parks, natural gateways to the city, and major arterial streets. This is sort of what we were talking about Bring last night. Up, yeah, you want that one? It's <laughs> yeah, I want this England. It's just $17 million. <laughs> 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 But, I mean, I just wanted to, like, give you an idea about what an impactful artwork is. And, I mean, the idea of gateways and, and, and art that kind of really helps to establish a destination or reinforce a destination has come up frequently. The next one is this. We also at our workshop last night, we talked about this, is employing art to reinforce the Maryland Arts and Entertainment District and the Paseos that connect arts and cultural venues. So here you go. This is what we were talking about. Strengthen the Arts and Culture Commission as the city's steward of public art. So as we begin to define what the Urban Art Fund is, it's your role to make sure that you are advocating for it and you're, you're taking that plan and using it as the framework for your decisions. The other piece, and I want to talk a little bit about this, um, some of the conversations I've had, building partnerships with businesses, developers, artists, arts and community organizations to leverage public art dollars. It would be really good if when you are developing programs that you think always about who are the natural partners. You don't want to make all the arts organizations completely dependent on the Urban Art Fund for their sustenance and for doing things in public settings. You really want to be the seed that is planted that makes things happen in a larger way. And I noticed, you know, several of you have um, expressed concern about um, things that pop up on public sidewalks that are seasonal in nature in the downtown. And I, you know, and so your, your issue has always been why didn't they come to us? Well, I met this morning with the Downtown Glendale Association. I would take a different tactic. My tactic is, how can we help you? And so that's what I said. I said, you know, how can the Arts and Culture Commission, through the Urban Art Fund, help you to create something that's unique when it's seasonal? If they came forward with some funds, would you match it? And they said, that would be great. So, I mean, I think this is an opportunity for you all. Instead of saying, nobody asked us, you know, this is the opportunity to say, how can we work together? Because, you know, the, the people in, in the Downtown Glendale Association aren't necessarily people that are savvy about art, but if you help them, you could actually, this could be the initiation of a temporary art program. So that's one potential partnership. The other one, developers we talked about, and then also when you think about things like temporary art, events, and all of that, use the people that are here as supporters, whether they are panel members or whether you're reaching out to your local artists to begin to do some of the types of work that you're trying to accomplish, partnering with arts and community organizations. This is what really makes a community, is when the city really sees, the city's commissions really see themselves as part of the community as a whole, not just isolated to do the work on their own. So um, the other theme, creating opportunities for high quality temporary art in neighborhoods and citywide. I would love to hear how the workshop articulated that. I'm looking forward to seeing the notes on that. I think opportunities like this, there may be opportunities in empty storefronts. I know you've done this before, but there may be opportunities in empty storefronts on in the Maryland Arts and Entertainment Corridor, but so many different things that you could do with temporary art, whether it's commissioned or borrowed or cultural exchanges. This is a really good way to get your public art program started and, and popular, is really begin to get things out there that are new things that are going to be there for a while and then go away. You don't have to worry about them being controversial or durable because they're not going to stay forever. Um, educating the community about public art through tours, events, and other opportunities. I think you've had a great start on this with the um, utility box program where you've done some tours. And this is something that really should be incorporated into everything that you do and perhaps when the public art plan is put forward, the 
Arts and Culture Commission could um, maybe sponsor some kind of a series of events where public artists talk about their work or a symposium or some kind of tours, but get people really engaged in it so they understand that, it's, that it belongs to them. This is one of the other themes that we looked at last night is the idea of some kind of week-long, then Arlette, you mentioned this when I met, when I met with you one-on-one, -on -one, some kind of a week-long world multicultural arts festival in a prominent location. Or it could be something that's connected to something like Ciclavia, where people move from one place to another and there's, there's different kinds of expressions of art along the path or in different nodes or things like that. Um, something that is uniquely about Glendale. And, you know, one precedent for the, this is that um, this is what uh, Pasadena does with its um, cultural trust fund. They don't do um, a, a festival, but they do their art night a couple of times a year. And that's a very successful thing that gets people to understand what riches they have there. You do too. And it could be a tour that includes things that have to do with prominent historic buildings. There, there are just so many things that are unique to Glendale that could be woven into some kind of an annual event. And that's a really good use of your trust fund. Could I say something in that point? Or yes, yeah, that? go ahead. Uh, on that one, there's something that kind of is very important for me. Uh, there is one idea is to entertain people of Glendale and to do events and to have people participate. The other one is to make Glendale a destination. Yes. So people from elsewhere will come. It's not specifically to make something that is unique about Glendale, but whatever we present and whatever festival or expo for all kind of businesses, even from hairstyling to makeup to fashion, everything that there is more money in it rather than paintings and sculptures that nowadays only very rich people get involved in that most probably. But the fact is that we need to make it a thing that everybody is interested long enough for people to come and stay here. Naturally, when people from elsewhere come to Glendale for certain events, Glendalians would be interested as well to be part of it. Mm -hmm. So it is major to make decisions that would interest everybody else to come to Glendale. Of course, yes, I agree, yeah. So from last night, I could hear more of how we could educate each other. How could we, that's good, but we need to do something that we would be worthwhile for other people to come and spend time with us. You're right, yes. And, and they're right also because it's very important for people to get behind what you're doing. So, yes. you know, educating people is, is, is a very important first step. That's right. Um, so this is your key issue, and it, it's the key issue for me, too, I have to say, <laughs> that, you know, when we do plans, you know, we could do, like, the best plan in the world, but it's not going to happen unless you ha ha have the ability to implement it. And so in a lot of ways, as big as the ideas are, the most important idea is to be able to get adequate staffing to support and, and build the program. And it's not just to have a staff person who is working with you and implementing the urban art program. It's to have somebody that is, is knowledgeable, is able to build partnerships, and is at a high enough level in the city to be able to call somebody up and command a meeting with somebody at a high level within the city. Because building a public art program is entirely about partnerships and building relationships. And so it has to be somebody that really knows what they're doing and has the ability to pick up the phone and, and have a meeting with somebody that's the head of the Chamber of Commerce or the head of the planning department or whatever it is and work together to make it happen. I did have the conversation with the current city manager about this and it's possible, and Michael and I talked about this also, that within the Urban Arts Fund it's, it's totally legal to have a staff person that is funded out of a fee because you need somebody to administer that fee. It's really going to be an advocacy effort because like all other cities in California, adding staff comes with its own unique challenges that have to do with benefits and all of that. 
but you can't run this program without staffing and no, there's no way you can run a program on volunteer efforts. So I think this is going to be a key issue and as the city transitions to a new city manager, it's a conversation we're going to have to have again. So, and then lastly, we talked about this a little bit, providing developers with the tools to, to encourage on-site public art. One tool is when they come in, there's somebody in the planning department that shares with them that this is an opportunity, not a challenge. Um, and then the other thing is, is you know, there, there are ways that, that there could be um, something put up on the web page or a little guidebook or something that really basically explains to the developers what the opportunities are for them and also what, the, what value it adds to their projects. So those are the emerging themes. We have any comments on those? No, just a question. I hope, a question or comment, I don't know which one it is. <laughs> the fact is that I hope first Art and Culture Commission would be kind of uh, put on the map of the city government first. That means all the departments would, in collaboration, would work and come to an understanding to include whenever as needed. And then with other community organizations around, and the staff person hopefully would be able to make all the connections and make sure, you know, there is no intention not to include, but maybe even there is no awareness that they should, so that awareness could be built. Right. And negotiations done, so right. accordingly as needed. Because they want us here, but they are not taking the best advantage of the possibilities that commission could offer. You're right. Well, a commission without a department is kind of like a, I don't know, a fish without a bicycle. You know? <laughs> um, it's, I mean, most, there, you, it's unusual not to have a cultural affairs department in a city of this size, but let's start with the staff person. Yes. Then you'll see yes. where you go from there. Mm -hmm. I think starting with a staff person would be a really good thing. But it's a big stride for the city to have Arts and Culture Commission, too, because I know that for some years there was a little struggle. Like I even know. if we do need to have a commission or not, now we do have a commission, so You've we could establish it now in a proper department that is also uh, as library and art and culture uh, department. So hopefully now with the proper staffing, we could go ahead and do whatever with your help and your expertise, I hope we would achieve that also. I hope so. Yes. A couple, couple questions. Um, so point taken about um, working with the downtown uh, association. How do you think, what, what is the best format for us as individuals or a commission, but maybe as individual commissioners to reach out and get involved in the conversation with them? We'll put it in the plan. Okay. Um, and I think at that, and when you have a staff person, I think that you know it's not, you're obviously not going to get it done by the time the nutcrackers go up. You know, it'll probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, think about unique artist design, nutcrackers, and sugar no, plum no. I'm, I mean, I'm not passing judgment on anything. And I mean, I I'm not going to do that anymore. Traditions. I mean, I was. I'm, I'm reading a book right now that's about um, New the York works. in the 1700s, and they're describing the Christmas traditions, and people would put oranges in their window with candles in them. I mean, there are, you know, so many traditions and so many cultures. It's just like the, there's so yes. much that you could do that would be so much broader. So I think have a plan, have a staff person, and then that could become one of your temporary artwork projects. And it could be something where you you bring them out each year, or you add new ones each year. There are a lot of possibilities. Um, so um, um, In that regard, could I add something from sure, the past yeah. as well? This was done before when we had our own staff, and it was the Art and Culture Department, uh, Art and Culture Commission was staffed differently. We used to have mixers twice a year, and our staff person was inviting all the downtown, etc., different major organizations that they would meet, and then there would be some of the artists involved, and commission was there. So we had great time together. We got to know. There was a lot of conversation. So hopefully we could get that back now yeah. that we are more structured. Absolutely. Yes. Um, it, last night, and I, I went on the walking tour, and it was just great, and Jennifer oh, did a great job of and guiding us would. through. Um, but it, it became clear um, as we walked, duh, walk, that um, economic development is a really good natural partner yes. for you know, us because she and others, I'm sure, too, are so 
savvy about what what's developing and what needs Absolutely. to be done and what can be done. And then also Walk Bike Glendale and uh, Coalition for Green Glendale yes. seem to be too, because um, you know just the nature of what they're interested in and how it folds in with with public art. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I, I agree with you, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, you have this zero. Uh, what, what are you calling it in Glendale? That has to do with no uh, pedestrian deaths. Zero vision. Zero vision, but vision zero. But it's called something else. Street Smart Glendale. Street Smart Glendale. So I I I have met with the head of public works who's they're also responsible for transportation but I want to go back and have another conversation because um, there's some really interesting potential for doing some art interventions that actually help to slow traffic down whether it has to do with um, unique uh, unique crosswalks or things that are artworks that are in traffic calming devices or things of that kind that have been tried in other places and really help. I read something really funny recently about a city that put up unusual numbers for their s speed limits. Like it would say, instead of 25 miles an hour, it would say 17 miles an hour or something like that. And it, it was very effective because people were thinking, what? <laughs> you know, it, it kind of slowed people down because it just did something. That, so there may be some interesting partnerships with other things that the city is trying to accomplish, and I think that those are the kinds of things that we should also be looking at. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to talk with you about has to do with procedures and guidelines. Some of the issues that you've brought up in the past are things that really – happened because of a lack of procedures. So, for example, things that are on public rights of way that are artworks or appear to be artworks, that's an area where developing some kind of a guideline or a procedure would be useful. A couple of other things that concern me and I think would concern you as well and that have been <laughs> controversial in the past have to do with memorials. Um, I know that the Comfort Woman Memorial is a fantastic project. There are only three of them in the United States. It worked its way through the system, and it worked out fine. That said, um, sometimes people come and buy memorials off the shelf and just decide that they're going to go someplace on public property. And I think that it would be a good idea to develop a framework from, from physical memorials that if there are artworks that the arts and Culture Commission should be involved with it. The other thing is gifts of art. And Michael, is there a gifts of art? There, okay, so there is a gifts of art policy, so we don't have to deal with that. Um, and then just generally, what? It may need, yeah. So um, I'll be taking a look at that. And then I'll look at deaccessioning of artworks. I know things have disappeared. Um, they've become issues of artist rights that can really be um, challenging if you remove a work without the proper framework for it. And um, just a set of procedures that really talk about things like artist selection and all of those things. And I will be working on drafts of those and they'll come to you with the draft plan and then we'll have to really dig into them to a certain extent. Um. How exactly was the Comfort Women Memorial established? Is it the city council? I don't Where know. the Korean it was a, a gift organization? To the city. It was, I know it was a gift to the city. Um, and that it was worked through a little bit through the Sister City Association. Um, I don't, and when I talked to Dan Bell yesterday, he said there was quite a lot of conversation about where it would go. And it, and, and it was decided that it would go where it is. But I don't know any more about it than that. Do you? Was, it was presented to the council. The council mm -hmm. accepted it. Yes. I've had previous discussions uh, with the former parks director about coming up with guidelines for the establishment of these monuments. And, uh, and we can have, again, discussions with the current parks director. I know he's well. interested. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a good strategy because as, as soon as you start really thinking about public art, um, it's just lucky that you haven't had some kind of 
big controversy to take, quite honestly, because, <laughs> no. I mean, you could have so, one, I you mean, know. Uh, I mean, and actually, the other thing is that, you know, you do have a major gift of art, which is sort of an embarrassment, with all due respect to whoever's watching out there, um, at the police station. That was a gift of art. And I don't <laughs> think the Arts Commission was involved with that at all. Um, and so, you know, that would have been something where you could have had a conversation about, well, if, if you're going to do a heroic piece of art in front of the police station and people object to nudity, maybe you shouldn't do a nude sculpture, you know? Um, maybe you should do something else. Maybe you should ask the donor to provide funds and commission something. But you want to think about these kinds of things carefully so that you don't end up with a situation which is going to be the gift that gives on taking. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, for instance, I'm sure the Cultural Arts and Cultural Commission was not involved in any way with the memorial, the Korean Couple Memorial, right? I, I wasn't on the commission, well, but... You're lucky, it's because it's, it's a beautiful piece. So, yeah, I mean, I think we still out. out. I think yeah. there, but it seems like nobody's going to come to us uh, I think we have to go out to them, and that's going to be part of the thing that we really have to try to well, implement we is to be, this, out, yeah. be always present different places, different commissions where these kinds of things may come up and, and try to find avenues, opportunities, or collaboration with Absolutely. all commissions. And design something? boards and everything right. in the city. Is that the, but the that's process? Right. You, can yeah. have a, you can have a council policy. I, I, different yes. cities do it different ways. That's right. Where When I was in San Jose, there was a group of, there were things that were called council policies. And a council policy had to do with things like um, exhibits in city hall, gifts of art, memorials. Those would be council policies so that if something came to the council or to the city manager, there was a procedure that ran it through the Arts Commission. So you shouldn't have to be reactive or you shouldn't have to have your radar up saying, I hope nothing bad is happening. Yeah, it it right. should actually be a policy that if something of that happens, that there's a procedure for it. It's not just like, okay, somebody gave this to us, we're just going to stick it here. I 100% agree with you and disagree with you on that, that we should go to them because there are a multitude of events and departments and issues and, you know, etc. So there is no way, even with staff person or even with um, one and a half staff person, which we used to have, uh, that we could go. It should be a policy that they should come. The same way as if you want to drive, you know that you have to go to DMV and get exactly, your license. Yeah. So when you do that, then, then it would be easier to process and for the staff person to also process. All yeah, I that. agree. I mean, so, yes. the challenge will be um, you know, uh, the challenge will be whether it's a decision that the council wants to keep to themselves. If the council wants to be responsible for any yes. gift that comes to the city, then, you know, the best that you can hope for is that they, they come to you for advice. But it's, it would be good if there was some professional um, criteria for things like that, just because they become super controversial and sometimes they get vandalized and I mean you, you just want to make and the other the other problem with gifts is that somebody needs to evaluate whether they're durable and who's going to maintain them because a lot of times things come to cities they're not durable they fall apart and then it's sort of like well we don't want to insult the donor by not taking care of it but here we are left with a situation where this thing is falling apart and we don't know what to do to maintain it, so. I mean, what would be the procedure? You call them council uh, council policies. What would be the procedure, are they council Michael, policies here, to establish or they, council or, policies are they ordinances of or? this sort? Or what would be the established thing? Adding new ones that would. Sure, yeah. yeah. The it, the um, it depends where some of these uh, guidelines are placed. For example, uh, the city has in its administrative policy manual. Uh, rules for, you know, accepting gifts of art. And the council ultimately would, uh, can decide, um, you know, depending on, on the, re the report that's produced and the recommendations, you know, the, the obviously if, if the council accepts these recommendations, then many of the uh, powers and duties of the commission, you know, will change and, and more will be added if they, you know, if they accept the recommendations. Um, some of these other um, uh, guidelines, for example, guidelines to establish monuments don't necessarily, you know, it can be presented to the council for, 
for their, it should be presented to the council for their blessing, but it would be contained not in an ordinance, but probably the administrative policy manual, which, as Barbara mentioned, a little bit more f flexible when you talk about details, the specific details of, of the guidelines and requirements. Yeah, there are all these so different tiers that are out it's complicated. there. The answer is it's complicated. It is well, complicated. It's, it's complicated, but it does actually, it's, it's creating a set of rules that everybody abides by is extremely helpful. I mean, so you, maybe you're going to come up with a set of recommendations that we could go to council to I'll create some of these policies, policies for you. Policies, and yeah. then we can go to council to see Yeah, them. I will. I, I think okay. the other thing that is if there's a, a desire to fund or commission murals, we will develop a policy for that, too, because murals basically are things that have a lifespan um, that is connected to the nature, the quality of the wall and the, and the light, the amount of light that's on the wall and graffiti and all of those kinds of things. And so you want to develop a framework for that so that if somebody wants to tear the building down or build a building in front of it, you don't end up with a $1 million lawsuit, which actually happened in L.A. not too long ago. I think and Sean. the artist won, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, on, speaking about city council, you know, we all serve at the pleasure of our, our council members who appoint yeah. us. So, a uh, couple things. You know, one, I think the design review board, for example, they have flexibility to make decisions independently, but you know, city council is able to come in and, and reverse a decision, for example. Yeah, so that that, can that would give us this, you know, the kind of clout to to make those important decisions. Right. But you know, it gives them the flexibility where if something were you know felt that we yeah. voted incorrectly or. Well, council agree, can over, know, over, 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 overturn right. anything they yeah. want, but and, at least you'll have a framework. Yeah. And on the second half, I think we talked about it briefly last night, but, you know, we, being there last night was a great opportunity to see all the work and efforts you've been all putting into it and uh, everything that's kind of gone up to getting that great turnout and getting that much of a vibrant discussion going. Um, what can we do to also bring council along as well so that, we thank don't get down to that. early next year and present yeah. something and then, you know, but they didn't know what was going on all the Yeah, thank you for through. asking that. I would like to, to propose that we have a council study session on public art and we do it um, before we present a draft plan. And that that has to get agendized. And um, I discussed it with a couple of council people and I also discussed it with the city manager and everybody said yes that could be done. So it's really a matter of figuring out when and what I would do in that, in that case would be I think we should come with a number of commissioners, give them a slideshow like the slideshow that I showed last night, make sure there's nothing in there that's going to set their hair on fire or like I said, you know, <laughs> things that are understandable and clear. Um, and let them know the emerging themes that we're, we're working with and let them weigh in so that when we have a draft plan, we've heard their comments and we can be sure to incorporate their comments. I just finished a plan for Fort Worth where we actually were asked to come to council study sessions about four times. First when we were selected, then when we had started our interviewing process, then with the emerging themes and then the draft plan. So they had a chance to kind of mull over everything on multiple occasions. So I think it's a very good idea to do that. Um, and then also, you know, you've got now an army of people that are really interested in this, and I think that we should keep them engaged mm -hmm. so uh, council I, knows. Could I request something? When you yeah. have meeting with uh, um, council members, I would like all the, commission, all the commissioners to be present because we want to make sure that later on when we keep a dialogue with our appointing uh, council member, there would be more understanding because the topics sure. has been very clear on that. Yeah, I mean, that's a Michael Grant question about, you know, who should be there. But, I mean, that would be great. If we have a council session, study session and all the commissioners are there, that would be fantastic. You know, if it's legal, let's do it. <laughs> it could be uh, commissioners would not be talking about anything or deciding, yeah. but we will be present when you're providing the training or sure. information. Yeah. So it would be clear what information has gone yes. to the council members. So mm -hmm. later on, when we have individual dialogue with our own council person, right. then it, we would all be clear on that. Yeah. But we would not be talking, so there would be no Brown Act or no decision made. So Michael, I'm sure he would find a way to see if that would work. Yeah. I have one question for you um, as a commission that has, is something that I, that I find 
interesting and I need your advice. And that is that um, in a lot of cities, the council is selected by district. And so when you do artist selection in a particular neighborhood, you can go to the council people and say, who are some of the elders or influential people in your neighborhood in, in this district that we should involve in, in thinking about the artwork and helping to advise us about the character of the neighborhood and the, the opportunities and the pitfalls. You have a council that is elected at large. Mm -hmm. And so the whole aspect of community engagement with individual projects takes on a completely different tenor because you can't really go to the council people and say, who are the people in this neighborhood that we should be engaging? And there's no, there, the neighbors are not able to say to the council people, we were involved in this, we really like it, because the council doesn't really represent any particular neighborhood. So what is your thinking about community engagement in pieces that are not citywide in nature, that might be neighborhood specific? How would we build in community engagement and make sure that the council is happy with, with the work that we're doing? And what about, well, on some level, and this doesn't include the whole city, there, there are homeowner and neighborhood association groups, but that's limited. There's a very big chunk of the city that's almost like disenfranchised because uh -huh. they're not organized. Right. Um, but I remember being, I was on the selection committee for the art um, that went into Maple Park. Mm -hmm. And actually, the ideas of a few of us got over, we were going to have a neon thing and... Uh. There was a lot of pushback about that. But I think that there was some kind of a public outreach session, and I'd have to go back and check mm -hmm. before the committee made its decisions about which piece of art to select. There were about, you know, 10 applicants. And I think it involved, like, a public notice for a meeting, mm -hmm. and the city, we'd have to go back to the Parks Department and look at the archives okay. to see what was done, but I'm pretty sure something happened there, but it may be an out-of-date procedure that wouldn't work Yeah, I anymore. don't know, and, and when I talked with Eve Rappaport last week about the, what happened during her tenure as the public art uh, manager, she told me that almost all of the records had been destroyed after she left, So, which is really a, of concern, because mm. the only records that I actually have, the database, um, is was it hasn't been updated since 2005. Fortunately, the web page is updating a lot of things in terms of telling us where things are. But in terms of the actual history of how things came about, I don't know whether there are any records left. So. And there's and there have been so many changes. I mean, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that if, happens, Other than Terry know. Deaver, I don't think any of you guys were on. I have been. The, I've the, been on two the, of them no, with Parks, and I can. Ask, no, I'm talking about Maple Park specifically. You know, uh, if the records are not there, still there are staff members who might not be right now with the Parks, but they are in the city. We yeah. can contact mm -hmm. them. Yeah, there's well, not. Well, when as, you have a new public art as, manager, we'll let that person do yeah, the archaeological right. dig. There's, there's not as much as. There's not as much historical memory no. in the I mean, city as you would I mean, it's interesting because I'm sure that the city's it's got record retention policies. Every city does. You know, there must be record retention policies, but oh, who knows where they are. Somebody How? shredded them? Is that what happened? Who knows? I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I certainly haven't found them except, except for the files that I have that start from 2005 back. And I would say at least a half a dozen of the p things in that file don't exist anymore. With the Parks and Rec, I can find it for you and contact you. I'll, All right. I'll find the staff member. I'll check with the city right. manager's office to Good. see where she is right now. Okay. And I'm sure it, with her memory, because she organized a lot of stuff uh, that would for be great. that department. Yeah. So they can give you information. That would be great. But, so, but on that note, I did want to add, you know, this is something I kind of wanted to have a conversation with you about as well, because, you know, we had this great turnout last night. Yeah. Uh, it was great to see all the engaged people that, and it was a very diverse crowd from young to old, different yeah. ethnicities, uh, really was kind of representative of the makeup of Glendale. Um, but kind of one of the challenges we talk about at the Glendale Unified School District as well is you'll have a group of parents who are very active and engaged and we're grateful for them because they do so much, but sometimes you don't get the full input that you would like, you know, from a very broad audience right. to kind of inform your decisions. So just some thoughts on, you know, as you come forward with these recommendations, we do have a great pot of 
valuable feedback and data from right. the folks we have been engaged with, but then you know there is a lot of people outside that right. that sphere. Well, I'm th I've been thinking about that, and I think I'm thinking two things. One is that um, a lot of people said, "When are we going to meet again?" Which was fantastic. So we are going to take the notes that we got from the meeting, condense them, thank everybody for coming and share the notes, but then we're going to also, after we've presented to City Council, when we have a draft plan, we will do another public meeting to get people involved. Another thing that I've been thinking about, and I really would love your feedback on this, is it might be really interesting to create some kind of a, um, a little ethnic council that could be advisory to the Arts and Culture Commission that represents some of the different cultural in organizations that exist in Glendale for different groups. Because I heard all of you say, well, have you reached out to the Koreans? Have you reached out to the Armenians? Have you reached out to the Mexican Americans? And I, you know, there are so many different groups. It might be really interesting to think about whether you want, let's say you were doing a, a, a cultural festival. But to have a group of people that you could tap that represent organizations that really care about the arts and culture of their, their, their group and have them be able to advise you because it's just too, there, there just is so much going on that you want to be able to have people that are informed from each one of those communities. So I don't know, it's just something that I thought about and it might be something that you want to think about as well. I mean, I know, Ara, when you put together your exhibits, you have to go digging for the right people to advise you. And so it's sort of like maybe we should try to at least maybe have a list of potential advisors that represent cultural organizations from different ethnic backgrounds or something because you've got, this is one of the great things about Glendale is you've got so many interesting groups here. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely an issue. What the Glendale issue we is, talked you know? about, about cars reaching out to these different communities and I think it's part of our duty also to reach right. out and get them engaged, involved in the process. So I think that's a really great idea to have that kind of a, uh, a committee. I guess it's, it would be a committee of different organizations. Or like an, advice, yeah, like an, an advisory, advisory team committee. or something. Yeah, yeah, something of that sort that would then connect us with, with other communities that a lot of times may not get engaged in city right. stuff. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, one of the really interesting things that I heard from Dan Bell yesterday when I talked with him about Sister Cities was he said, you know, when the Comfort Memorial went in, some of the Japanese groups were very upset because this has been a huge issue over the years, right? And he said the interesting thing about it is it's really strengthened the city's relationship with the Japanese consul. We're now talking to each other all the time. So, you know, this is a kind of testament to what it means to actually begin to reach out to all these different groups. So that's about all I have except to really say let's think about what your next steps are. We've talked about um, having a study session with city council. Um, there might be things that you want to do with making sure that all the people that have become engaged continue to be engaged and, and are able to um, show up when we do presentations. Um, I think that another thing that would be really great would be to be able to have each one of you have a relationship with the council person that appointed you so that when we have talking points and a, and a plan, you can carefully explain all those things to the council person so they get on board with it. And um, I don't know what else there is really to, to discuss if you have ideas about other next steps. It's just I'm fascinated with what you're going to do for us. <laughs> Me too. I really mean that. I really truly now it is clear on what needs to be done. I'm so grateful. Thank you. And thank, thank you for you know organizing, having you and all that stuff. What thank do you, you see the timing of a study session? Well, you know, the holidays are coming up, so I think we want to have a draft plan by sometime in January. So I would think that we would have to do the study session at the beginning of January, if that's possible, before we have a draft plan so that we know that if there are things that are coming forward as emerging themes and that we've begun to flesh out, that if there's something that is going to be a huge red flag that we know about it and we figure out how to deal with it. So um, 
I don't really know um, who would organize that, whether it would be uh, Chuck, would that be Cindy that would reach out to make that happen? Yeah, well, I'll talk with Cindy about it. I mean, I know it's really hard to, to, to schedule things with city councils because they always have a really big number of things on their plate. And I'm sure that the change of city manager is going to become something that they're very preoccupied with. But um, let's see what we can do. Um, it's only a short flight from San Jose to, to here. Anything else? Yes. If I can also make one more request. Um, sure. So one of the, you know, when you look at our qualifications for who are commissioners, you know, yes. one of them, you know, calls out for one elected official, employee, student, or volunteer of the Glen Unified School District. And I think the thought, um, I wasn't on the commission at the time, but I think the thought is to have some type of relationship with our schools and our youth. So, you know, I think I beyond all the different things we're doing, I think we also have a responsibility to cultivate young artists. So I agree. if you could look into, as we're going through policies, if there's any mechanism or kind of a policy for having a youth commissioner or I a student commissioner. I love that idea. I, I w when, we were, when I was in Seattle, they actually had this kind of interesting program that was like a training program for young people so that, that would put people, young people on commissioners, on different commissions so that they could see how government worked. We could, I'll look into that. I think it's a great idea. Great. You want to train future leaders, right? Yeah. yeah. That would be great. Thank on you. On that, we used to have that. Before Did we you? were seven... Uh -huh. And of the seven people who were on the commission, one was definitely was supposed to be from uh, Glenville Unified School District. Um, doesn't matter what was the status, a teacher, a board member, doesn't matter. Yeah, I think matter. we still have that. One yeah. for that. And then we did have uh, a, one, a student either from uh, um, GCC or it could be a student in any of the uh, universities all around, but uh, residing in Glenda. I think it's a great that idea. That was part of it. So those two were the major issues, and then the rest were people from the community who represent that community. Okay. So it is nice if we could have added that to more, so we could make sure definitely that uh, one definitely represents I love that one. idea. We have the seats. So. Yeah. <laughs> you have the seats. You do have the seats. Okay. Thanks. Um, so... Let's, I want to be clear what the what the next steps are then. Yeah, so the the council um, study, session. study session, which will be in January, and then the final draft in January. Um, up then that up until then, are we just like waiting? Or, um, I mean, speaking to our council members who appointed us, I think it's critical to give them, you know, report back about the, the great meeting we had and, and right. the kinds of things that you are finding out or right. we're going to do. I'm going to start. Like to, with, yeah. We got to get. I think the momentum has yeah. to be. We have to keep it going. I'm not sure if I cars agree. has anything. Planned. Well, I'm planning to start writing. I'm going to start writing immediately. I'm not going to come back in in November because I think that I won't have any. I won't be finished. But and I don't. If you have a meeting in December, I could begin. I could develop. I could bring a draft plan that's fairly rough to you in December that we could start talking about, and we could use that as the basis of what we present to city council without calling it a plan. We can call it uh, preliminary ideas or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. So, and that would be good because then we would really be able to kind of think about what um, what the form of it is going to be before we share it with City Council and then be between your comments and their comments then we come forward with a real draft plan yeah, I think that's in really January. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So do I don't know if you're planning a meeting in December if you yes, are. we usually do and if need Excellent. be we'll have a special meeting. Definitely okay, we always do but in case it coincides okay. with anything. December we'll 25th have a is that meeting. the meeting? Yes. Uh, 21. Yeah. 21. 21. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I'll leave 21. that to you to figure out whether you're all going to be mess. here. If it has to be a different date, that's fine. I'm not going anyplace in December. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's critical to have yeah. that. I think yeah. that's really important. Just one quick quick one. I know. Sure. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, that's what you're here the, for. The, the Glendale Municipal Code, the things we talked about, would your plan include some draft language of yes. how you see Good. It will, absolutely. And I'll also be looking at the municipal code section on the percent for art to see if there's anything there that needs tweaking. Um, the, it, it came about, the, the percent for art came about, the, the last revisions came about in a kind of unusual way. And so there was, I think there were some compromises involved. So I think that there, that 
this would be a good time to take another look at that as well. That's right. Yeah. So I, in the meantime, I don't know, Tamara, I have anything to say? In the meantime, is, is what, what happened last night, all the information, is that going to be feedback to the yes. I don't want to wait three well, months and then January come up with this 500-page document say, here it is. We don't want to do that, right? So we will be compiling all the people who signed up on the email last night. And I know we had, you know, really good attendance. And I want to make sure you guys know that the Library Arts and Culture did invite all the council people to the meeting last night. Um, and we also, you know, uh, reached out to press. Tom Lorenz put out the media advisory. I personally wrote to the Glendale News Press city editor twice. And we didn't have any coverage, yet we had this great advocacy. And so we will be connecting with those people. And I think on a one-on-one -on -one basis with your particular city council person, um, I think it's great to establish that connection and let them know what kind of feeling and buzz and energy we had in the room so that when we do meet again, um, we'll have more of an engagement. Because uh, I think all of the, the public will be looking to the stewards to you know, get the, the plan off the ground, et cetera. So um, again, we're going to be reaching out. I think that if you can let us know also other opportunities in the meantime for some public engagement, even if it's tabling or putting out um, the postcard that doesn't represent the October 18th date, but just represents the website in general, so that it just doesn't go dead for two months while the plan yeah. is being written. There's a tabling event, Chuck, right, that's coming up with uh, at the Paseo. We're going to do an event in December, right, at the library. So that's an opportunity. Uh, yes, we're yeah. planning a, an event on Saturday, December 9. Okay. Yeah, it was in... At the Paseo. At the Paseo with performances and things, I think it, that right. would be a great tabling exactly, opportunity. Exactly, exactly. And, oh, yeah. you know, when we were at Tech Week, we actually um, had the monitor and we got the hotspot from the library and we showed people how to sign up um, and we also showed them what the website does and so that they're actually more acquainted with what exists in public art. So part of it is, is a public art education, not just putting in your comments, but to allow the public to understand what the process is and what it means and what public art can be. So we'll be obviously in contact um, with Chuck and with Cindy and the team there to be able to continue to do the outreach. And if you have other ideas and things come up, we'd, we'd be happy to be there. Excellent. Yes. Uh, could we have just a little feedback next meeting in uh, November? I know that you can't be here and you're putting all the other work together. Just on whatever was last night, it is uh, fascinating to know. Basically, a small feedback of what was said and what was uh, asked for. If you could present it to us uh, in we November. Present the, the notes from yeah. all the workshops and that we can present great. the attendance and all, all the other things. Okay. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Next item, please. Item 5B, action item 5B1, motion approving, approving artist stipend of up to $1,000 per installation for artists selected for the Adams Square Mini Park gas station from January through June 2018. Motion. Chair Oshigan, um, commissioners, city staff. Uh, staff is planning to issue a call for artists for the Adams Square Mini Park gas station uh, next month in November 2017. Um, if we can do that, proposals will be reviewed in December, and up to three installations will be selected for January through June 2018. Uh, our recommendation is that commission approve a motion that artists selected for the installation at the Adams Square Mini Park gas station uh, for that short length of time receive a stipend of up to $1,000 per installation. We're basing this very arbitrarily on the Brand Library Performance Series stipends. Um, stipends for fiscal year 2018-19 can be discussed in the context of the next 2018-19 work plan. Uh, which will be informed by the priorities determined by the public art master plan. Um, this is part of art hap this, last time we discussed that this becomes part of art happens anywhere. Uh, no, 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 they are they are separate. Art happens anywhere is a slightly different program not associated with any one public 
uh, uh, place. place. Um, there is one uh, AHA or Art Happens Anywhere proposal that uh, is meant now for the um, Adams Square Mini Park gas station. You may or may not uh, uh, go with that, but in uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose momentum on the gas station um, as far as your programs. And um, obviously there's, there's much to think about with the public art master plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why only for the, even though that's a major thing, I'm very happy because that community gets involved, everybody gets involved. It's a good role model for the rest of the city of Glendale, how um, a group of people get together and organize stuff. But why only for the Adams Square and not for the others? Uh, well, the Adams Square Mini Park gas station has never been funded um, as, as uh, uh, I think, uh, Commissioner Sahaki has suggested and others. It should be funded. Um, uh, however, you do have a public art master plan that's going to, we hope, take care of, of some of those uh, uh, technical issues, you know, funding all the programs, funding, you know, uh, again, this has not been funded in the past. The so there's no money from all involved. Of there's a very minuscule right. amount for... Um, and, and the thousands would be to the artists or just for taking care of the place, oh, no, helping no, the, the installation? Artists, artists. The just for the artists, strictly, artists feet. Strictly for the artists. Um, uh, as you know, the roof was uh, repaired uh, over the summer. Uh, it is a parks facility, uh, city facility, but it's uh, managed by parks. They take care of that, That's that right. entire park, including that facility. Uh, but the artists, to this point, have not been uh, given any kind of stipend. Do we ever give that much money? I have nothing against it. It's just I want to know, do we have, have we ever given that amount of money to the other artists who have participated or not? Um, I can say that the uh, uh, artists who participate in the uh, utility box program uh, get a stipend of $750. All the material and their expenses have to come out of that. So their okay. paints, their brushes, whatever. So again, um, you know, this is... How much do we pay for the performance at the plaza? Uh, the performance at Brand Library is 1000 Performance at Central Library has been 500 Okay. Just I wanted to see where we get the $1,000. Well, the way, the way this is worded, if I'm interpreting it right, it's up to a thousand dollars and we would depending on the complexity of the piece and certain other circumstances we would decide on a one-off basis what the stipend would be for each uh, the way it's written yeah you could do that um, you could just say a thousand dollars across the board you could say a different amount of money across the board um, again uh, rather than get you mired into what to do with the gas station at this point, this is this is going to we hope tide everything over until uh, there is a public art master plan that will include this. But the up to a thousand dollars is not meant to be a mandatory thousand. It's meant to be no more than. It's like a limit on spending. Either way. I believe that would be a better wording it because uh, we need to make sure that the way we are um, rewarding our artists, kind of there is a kind of an understanding or it's a kind of a, there's no competition in that. It's a kind, it's more uh, structured, uh, not one gets more and one gets less. Let's, let's discuss about the amounts more properly. So later on it would not be a discussion how come this one is being paid more than the other one is not. It's important. So, so you think ahead, it should Chant. be a thousand, no. not up to? You think it should be a thousand? No, you just said you thought it should Hold be a thousand. Let's, let's Go ahead. Well, I mean, I, first I want to thank staff. Uh, I think we've been beating the drum for a while. Um, and uh, I also want to give a special thank you to uh, former Commissioner Deaver. Um, because we've had many discussions about this uh, over the years on the commission, um, and, and uh, as Chuck mentioned, you know we 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 fund all of the projects that the commission works on, That's except fine. this one project. And so you for should. me, it's a big equity issue, uh, and also just as a principle, I think artists should be compensated. And um, you know the utility boxes, we're paying the artists 750 per uh, box for their work, and um, you know I think this is less frequent than the utility boxes, so I think it deems 
um, and it's a more it's a larger space also. Um, and you know there there will be variations between what each piece and each artwork and exhibition is, but I think a thousand is an appropriate starting point. Um, again, this is only for the next year. When the public art master plan comes, we can also reassess based on all the different projects of whether it should be a thousand, whether it should be two, whether it should be less. And we'll I think at that point be looking at all of our projects, and it might be a better time to make those comparisons. Um, you're right. I 100% agree with you that we should compensate our artists, for sure. There is no even question on that. It just there should be more equity in how we are doing that, and it should be properly discussed on what basis it's decided. Uh, utility boxes, they are there, and they are there for quite a long time. There are many of them, but they are they're there for ever unless something happens, but these ones are sporadic. It doesn't mean it's less of value, but nonetheless, there, we should have a criteria for how we are, but definitely without any question, artists need to be compensated for the work that they are providing. That's not a question mark. But now, to have a certain number and later on with a work plan to change that, to me somehow doesn't feel right either. So let's keep it kind of open till we have the work. I mean, to compensate, but not make it up to 1,000 based on deciding. So later on, it would be easy to make it less or more. That's my suggestion. Um, could we ask a question about how that would be? I personally feel we should make it just a flat 1,000 um, and then work with the artist to make sure that the exhibition, of course, is going to be selected. So you're going to have choices of what exhibition goes in there. Um, and you'll have influence over so that you deem it's worth the thousand, let's say. But how would it work if it was up to one thousand? Does that mean staff per proposal would make a decision of where, you know, what what stipend amount to give? I see what you mean? Uh, yeah, that's about what would happen. Staff and the selection committee mm -hmm. would have to make that decision. That would make me more comfortable till we get the work plan finalized about all the details of that procedure because then artists would not feel that we are being paid less or more because. But I'll give you the flip well, argument of that. If yeah. I'm an artist applying for a project and I don't know how much I'm going to get paid until I'm selected and then I'm told how much I'm going to get no, paid, I'm also uncomfortable with that. And it's going to affect oh, which artists apply for it. And Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, we have a flat, flat artist fee for all the other uh, projects, all the other um, things that we do, and I think, you know, the gas station, the, that gas station is an actual installation. Uh, it's actually, the material costs more, the work is more. It, it's quite an effort to actually do an installation in that space, while the utility boxes are much more contained. You know, this is what you do. So, um, to me, a thousand is also very reasonable. I agree. Well, I think we have the majority who do agree. <laughs> then I'd like to make a, of what I think, huh? I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, that we move forward with this proposal for a stipend of 1000 flat for the exhibitions at the Adams Square Mini Park gas station. I'll second that. Commissioners? Okay. Yeah, roll call. Commissioners Dehovanessian? Since all agree, yes. <laughs> Tahakian? Yes. Vidor? Yes. Chairperson Oshigan? Yes. Item 5B, 2, motion approving so celebratory event to include recognition of non-urban art fund sponsored organizations and artists by commission. Um, Chair Oshigan, commissioners, at the August 18th meeting, uh, Commissioner Sharikian suggested that the commission recognize participants in commission sponsored programs. Uh, commission at that time approved a motion that artists who are Urban Art Fund sponsored in the past two years uh, receive recognition in the form of a letter and a certificate, and staff is working to issue letters of recognition and certificates. Um, so at the September 28th meeting, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the commission asked for additional discussion regarding the criteria for recognizing artists not hired by the city of Glendale, uh, therefore not under the Urban Art Fund sponsored programs. Uh, and so in order to ensure that recognition is consistent and fairly applied to the multitude of artists and arts organizations in the community, uh, staff recommends that the commission approve a motion to hold an annual celebratory event 
to include recognition of non-urban art fund sponsor organizations and artists to be implemented once the public art master plan is completed. Uh, at that time, the details can be more fully discussed by the Commission. Uh, there's no fiscal impact associated with this report, uh, but it's saying let's have a celebratory event and what, what form that event takes and how you recognize uh, uh, non-commission-sponsored uh, artists or organizations uh, is up for discussion, perhaps at a later date. Any comments? Yes. Um, it's an excellent idea. Again, we used to have it. I think it was called Diamond Awards. And it was very well received by the community. Uh, we got the recommendation that the council also signed and etc. put the recommendations for the event. Just what I want to make sure is that we do have a criteria for the selection, not the ones that they have done for the urban art, but those from organizations who really uh, have supported art in the community, etc., to have a criteria for the selection. So it would make it easier uh, for the committee to make a decision that every year who are going to be the recipients. It's an excellent idea, and definitely we need to do it. Thank you. Um, it, my understanding of this things, is... Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. My understanding of this, the way you explained it is that this is an, like a party to collectively celebrate, and it's not an award thing. It, it's going to be up to you. It oh. could be that the public art master plan kind of drives um, a, a kind of all-encompassing party um, that would honor all kinds of arts organizations. It could be... Uh, that you or the public art master plan may say you should pick one or two per year like the diamond awards I think there were four or five that that remains to be seen but the notion of a an annual event okay. is what what we're we're uh, suggesting here I, I really like the idea of having this annual event and we can draw up a list of arts organizations who we think have contributed to Glendale in this yeah. past year, for instance. Very inclusive. Yes. And we can have inclusive, and we just invite everybody to this yeah. big party, and there are no awards, it's just a recognition of everybody who has made an impact to Glendale Arts, and we see that that we are we are working with them to improve Glendale. Do we give them way. a recognition of something, or we just No, because there are no specific people there, it's just organizations are invited. Um, the other thing is to give the artists that the commission um, uh, engages in different artworks to give them a recognition, mm -hmm. right? That's different, and that's more kind of like the Diamond Awards, perhaps. But this is right now we're just talking about having a recognition, and then having a big party for for different arts organizations. Uh, the party and all that is great, and recognition is fantastic. It's just with organizations who have really been helpful. It is amazing that when you give something, a piece of uh, whatever, and it is taken back to their organization, somehow it's a moment and something that kind of remains there as a kind of they have been recognized. Uh, we can recognize as many as you know, need be, but kind of it sounds good. But I'm not that keen about either way. It just the way I saw it worked. It was great that organizations who really sponsored and were there and participating, they got, besides that, you know, recommendation or commendation, they have uh, kind of something, a little plaque or something saying thank you because somehow they post it somewhere and it is there that they have been recognized. But it's, I'm fine either way. I mean, we could do that. I mean, if there are particular, we could maybe, if there are particular organizations that made an impact on that particular yeah. year. Then we can hand select a few, but invite everybody. Yeah, of course. Everybody, Something everybody like gets that. recognition. Those people get a little kind of a, uh, no, whatever plaque. Doesn't need to be expensive. It just it makes it kind of for the other ones to feel that uh, they have. It, it's it's an object there that is continuously in their office somewhere. You know, it helps. So. And, uh, you know, as we were talking with Barbara as well earlier, you know, one of the kind of ideas I was thinking about was, you know, we have a State of the City event where it's a sit-down luncheon, which is I don't think what we're thinking about doing here, but it's a big event where you kind of hear what the State of the City is. So you hear about how our fire department's doing, what innovative program the city's doing. So it would be nice if we can incorporate some type of State of the Arts in Glendale theme to the, this event. So it's an opportunity not just to maybe honor some people, and of course I think that would be great too, but also as, you know, here's what the Commission's been doing, here's where we think arts are going. 
here are these five great arts organizations that just moved into the city, like give an update to the community on arts in general, not just what the commission is doing, but maybe what, what other things are happening in Glendale. Sounds great, it just it needs money. I suppose we have to see how money could be allocated for that because that is big time money compared to the rest. So that could be incorporated. If it works, why not? If we can spend the money, why not? And just so this motion is really just to uh, our intent to hold an event, and we're still going to then discuss the details at yeah. a later date, right? Correct. Right. Okay, great. So I motion that we do hold an event to recognize the artists who are with Art Fund and those who are not, but they have done a great job in the community. I'll second that. <laughs> Commissioners Jehovanesian? Yes. Sahakian? Yes. Vidor? Yes. Chairperson Oshigan? Yes. Item 6, Commission staff comments. Any comments? We're like commented out, I think. Yeah, I think we have talked too much. <laughs> Michael's like, no comments? What's no going comments. on? <laughs> we, we, we did uh, talk. No? no? All right. Okay. Any written communication? No. I'm no, sorry. No written communication. We are adjourned. Oh.